Good evening, Luther College and friends. My name is Rebecca Green, and I'm a junior here at Luther College representing Interfaith in Action, Luther College's student interfaith organization. On behalf of the Center for Ethics and Public Engagement and the Coalition of Civil Freedoms, sponsors of tonight's event, I want to welcome and thank you all for taking the time of your evening to come and engage in this important conversation. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Miko Peled, to our campus this evening. Born and raised in Jerusalem, Miko Peled is a Jewish Israeli who comes from a long familial line of Israeli government and military officials. But when tragedy struck his, struck his family in 1997, he joined a dialogue group of bereaved families belonging to both sides of the Israeli-Palestine conflict. His experiences in Palestine, coupled with the relationships he developed in these dialogue groups, led him to work and advocate for Palestinian human rights. Pellet has committed the complexities of his journey into writing and is the author of two books. The first, The General's Son, Journey of an Israeli in Palestine, shares the narrative of his own life as a son of an Israeli general. Alice Walker, Pulitzer Prize winner and author of The Color Purple, said of the General's Son, there are few books on the Palestine-Israel conflict as hopeful as this one. Pellet's most recent book, Injustice, the Story of Holy Land Foundation Five, is an exposition of the miscarriage of justice and the prosecution and conviction of five Muslim Palestinian Americans connected with the Holy Land Foundation. Of this work, Pulitzer Prize journalist Chris Hedges writes, Miko Pelled sheds a light on one of the most egregious cases of injustice committed to date against Muslim leaders in the United States. At the end of tonight's program, books will be available for purchasing and signing. Right up here. Tonight, we will hear from Pelled as he shares stories of his journey and wisdom as a prominent human rights activist in one of the most trying and complex global conflicts of our time. This will take place in a 40-minute question and answer conversation format with Professor Victoria Christman, followed by 20 minutes for audience questions. Now, please join me welcoming our guest, Miguel Pallet, to the stage. because there's a lot, your story is complex and, and long. So we'll see how much we can get through. So as Rebecca said, you come from a very influential family. Um, your grandfather was a signatory to the Israeli um, Declaration of Independence, and your first book, The General's Son, was really a history of the entire Palestinian-Israeli conflict in sort of an autobiographical genre. Um, and many of your family members are important in that story, but as the title suggests, your father is central. And so I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about him and his importance to your work and story. Your teaching microphone. Okay, yeah. Well, first of all, thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure to be here at the college, at Luther College, and a pleasure to see so many people here, and particularly so many young people. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. A little louder. A little louder, okay. And so, uh, so again, thank you all for being here. It's a real pleasure uh, to take part in this, and thank you for inviting me and setting this, setting this up. So, uh, growing up as an Israeli, if your father is a general, then that's uh, it's 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 the coolest thing it could possibly be, could possibly have. In Israel, the military is everything, everything, and the army particularly is everything. Now, the generation to which my father belonged, was, it was referred to as the, as the uh, 1948 generation, because they were young officers in 1948 when the State of Israel was established. And then they were generals 20 years later in 1967. And these are two monumentally important dates in the short history of the State of Israel. And both of them really changed the changed the face of, of Palestine and, and that part of the Middle East, you know, completely. Um, so to have a father like that is very, very significant. Now, what he did was, um, 
he was unique in that he uh, he did he was he was a kind of he was a general of course a military man, but he did not conform. So then, in 1967, it was 1967 war, which we call the Six Day War, um, and he was one of the. And, and in the weeks and months leading up to the war, there was a lot of debate on whether or not Israel should engage in war. And the debate took, was primarily between the, the Israeli government, the cabinet, and the heads of the military, the Israeli High Command, and my father was a member of the High Command. And he was one of the strongest voices demanding permission from the government to start the war. He was one of the clearest and strongest um, some people even refer to it as a coup, as an attempted coup, demanding that the government allow the army to start the war. Seven days later, or even less than that, six days later, as the war was winding down, and mind you, this, 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 there was, they spent more time discussing the war than they actually, the war itself. The war was over in six days. He stood up, the very first meeting with the Israeli High Command and said, now we have an opportunity to solve the question of Palestine. We must allow the Palestinians and, the, and to make peace. We must allow the Palestinians to establish their own state in these two areas that Israel created called the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Um, and uh, we can make peace with them and we can move on and live our lives in this this area that we chose to, you know, build the Jewish state. Um, nobody listened. People thought, some people suggested that he may have lost his mind because we just conquered all this land and we defeated the Arabs and everything is going so well. Why in the world would we want to give up any land? And he had very good explanations as to why. Um, but as he was saying this, the entire establishment, both the military and the political establishment in Israel, went ahead to do on the, you know, in those parts of the country, what they did in other parts of the country 20 years earlier, which is to bulldoze Palestinian towns and villages, destroy Palestinian communities, and build massively for Jews in what was the West Bank and East Jerusalem. And then from that point on, he, his entire life, the rest of his career, uh, became the promoter of peace with Palestine. All the way to the point where at one point he suggested or demanded that Israel engage in, in a, in, in a uh, conversation, in, in a, uh, oh, it wasn't quite a negotiation yet, but a conversation with the, the Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO, which was in those days the most extreme thing you could possibly say. And he himself met with members of the PLO, he met with Yasser Arafat and so on. Um, and then he died shortly after the Oslo Agreement was signed in 1990. He died. Well, it was the end of '93 that they signed the agreement. He died in '95, and at first he was very optimistic, and he congratulated uh, the Israeli government for signing the agreement and for shaking hands with Arafat. Um, but in Mar, he died in March of '95, and the very end of February, he wrote his last article. He used to write articles uh, and publish them, and the very last article he wrote was titled "A Requiem to Oslo." And he said the Oslo Agreement was a disaster, it was not going to lead to peace. Um, and he accused the state of Israel, the Israeli government, for not really wanting peace. So that was the backdrop, my, you know, the backdrop uh, for my, uh, my education, my, my growing up. Thank you. Um, in 1997, Rebecca alluded to this, to your, your family lost, you lost your niece to a suicide bomber. And to an outsider reading that story in your book, the reaction to that event by your sister, the mother of this girl, and by you is really quite amazing. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that event and your reaction to it. You know, I hear this question a lot, and I'm always amazed. Why would we expect that people would respond to an injustice with more injustice? Why do we expect, why are we, why are we impressed when people respond to violence with understanding or with the desire to end the violence. Why does that surprise us? Why does that seem so, you know, incredible? I really don't understand that. I think that should be the standard. You know, if we see injustice, we should respond with, 
with, with a demand for justice. If we see violence, we should respond with a demand and with, a, with an effort to end the violence. Yet when we do that, somehow it seems unique. It seems, you know, people are in awe of that. And I really don't understand that. Now, when my sister's girl was killed, this was two years after my father passed away, had already passed away. And so it was big news because the daughter of an Israeli general was killed. Others were killed too, but the daughter of the Israeli general was the news. And not only was he an Israeli general, but he was Mr. Peace of Palestine. So this was, you know, it took me about two days to get there. I flew, I was living in the US already. And you know, the front page of all the papers. It was on the front page of all the papers. Um, and then, you know, the Jews have seven days of mourning, and so people come, you know, reporters came, uh, people who came to mourn came, Palestinians, Jews, everybody came. And um, when my sister was asked about this, for, you know, her response, the expectation was that she would demand uh, retaliation, that she would demand killing, that she would uh, demand that they find the culprits. And she said a couple of very simple things that again shocked everyone because they were so, um, you know, simple, I guess. The first thing she said is don't talk to me about violence and retaliation because no real mother would want to see this happen to any other mother. The idea that we would kill someone in response to somebody's death is absurd. And no real mother would want to see that. And she said, in terms of who's responsible, she said, I hold the Israeli government responsible for my daughter's death. Because when you maintain an entire nation under occupation, under oppression, deny them their rights, kill their children, incarcerate their fathers by the thousands, is there really an expectation that there would be no response? Is there really an expectation that we will not pay a price? And the reason this reality exists is because of the Israeli government, and therefore both she and her husband, said very clearly that they point the finger at the Israeli government and hold them responsible uh, for what took place, what happened to, um, to their daughter, and to thousands of other Palestinians and, and many, many other Israelis. So of course this became bigger news. Because now this mother who was bereaved is, um, again, is, the expectation is that she would say something else. And here she is saying something that is so, um, really, I think, makes actually makes sense. And then I came back to the U.S., and you can't just come back after, after you carry the coffin of a little girl into her grave. You can't just go back to work the next day, like pretend like nothing happened. Um, and so I went back to the U.S., and I was looking for somebody to talk to. And I was very, very fortunate that I came across a um, Jewish-Palestinian dialogue group. And it was something that was beginning to develop all over the country, actually. In San Diego, there were a couple of them. And that was my very first interaction, my very first, <clears throat> excuse me, my very first meeting with Palestinians, even though I was born and raised in Jerusalem. And there are plenty of Palestinians in Jerusalem. Um, so that was the, that's how that developed. Can you say a little bit more about the dialogue group? So we're Luther College and the Center for Ethics, especially, are very interested in dialogue. We just have become part of a sustained dialogue program, and we work with the Nansen Center for Peace and Dialogue in Norway. Um, so we're believers in dialogue, and I'd like, I personally would like to hear a little bit more about how that works in San Diego <coughs> in the U.S., but also back in Palestine. Are there groups like that operating? You talked about in your book about the bereaved families network, where there are people who've lost people, but are there other dialogue groups happening on site as well? So this is, a, um, this is an interesting issue. So I entered into dialogue, I didn't really know what it was. I just wanted somebody to talk to who would listen and care, and you might know something. And in San Diego, where it's always nice and sunny and there's no urgency and no reason to care about anything, it's hard, to find, it's hard to find somebody to talk to about this. And really, it's not something you can bring up because it kind of creates a weird, um, you know, it's, it's a little weird. You know, bring up the Middle East, Palestine, all this. Who wants to talk about these things? 
And um, I looked and looked and looked, and finally I found this group, and I made contact with this uh, Palestinian who lives in who, um, lives in San Diego. He's also from Jerusalem. Um, we became friends, and the first meeting I was invited to was at his home. At his home. Um, and now, some 20 years later, we just had a, a book launch for my book at his home, which was very, really special. But anyway, so the idea was everybody talks about their own story. It wasn't about discussing politics, it wasn't about accusing, it wasn't about pointing fingers, which on this particular topic is very difficult. But everybody tells their story. So everybody told their story. Now, I come from this unique background where I had no doubt in my mind that I had full possession of the truth. <laughs> nobody, nobody knows more about this issue than me. Um, it's kind of part of my personality, so I think. But anyway, <laughs> so I came in, I came in, I came into this with that attitude. And I'm sitting with Palestinians, you know, and everything starts with food, of course. Everybody brings food, we eat, we talk, we chat, and then, okay, everybody, let's sit down, let's start. So everybody introduces themselves and talks about their story. And I'm hearing stories from Palestinians that could not possibly be true. Could not possibly be true because they are diametrically opposed to everything that I do. Where do you go with that? Now this is not some small uh, detail. It wasn't like an opinion about this or that or the other. This was fundamentally diametrically opposed to everything I knew to be true. You know, my father fought in 48. My mother was in Jerusalem. My, you know, I, mean, I have all these stories. And here they are. Stories about dispossession, expulsion, massacres, unbelievable, horrifying things. Now, I couldn't dismiss it either. I couldn't sit there and say, okay, they're all liars, which over, the, over, the, over time, I saw many people do. Other Israelis who would come and try this dialogue thing would walk away and then say to me, what are you doing sitting with these people? I mean, they're just a bunch of terrorists and anti-Semites. And I thought, they're not terrorists, obviously. And they're not anti-Semitic either. These are really good people. And they could, all, could not have all sat together and made this up. Now, I have an older brother, and he was a professor of political science at Tel Aviv University. So I called him up. I was really confused. I said, look, I'm sitting with these Palestinians, and they're telling me all these stories. And what's going on here? Could it be that what they're telling me is true? Because obviously, if what they're saying is true, we are absolutely not the good guys in this story. We are not the David in this David and Goliath story. And he said to me, well, as it happens, several Israeli historians had just published a few books. They, the, uh, the Israeli National Archives had opened the documents related to what happened during the 1948, which is particularly the time that we're talking about, which we call the War of Independence, Palestinians call the catastrophe. And he said, well, check them out. And he gave me the names of these historians, and check them out. So I went to the library, and I got like 25 books, and I read them all. And I was in disbelief. I was in absolute disbelief. Because everything had been turned around. All the heroism and the pride that I felt towards who I was. And Israelis, you know, for us, 1948 is a sense of enormous pride. We came back from the Holocaust. We, you know, we rose, we stood, we established the Jewish state. We were the few and we defeated the many Arabs who tried to kill us. And, you know, we were good and righteous. And... But that's not what these people are telling me. And that's not what these, all these Israeli historians have just you know, revealed. Um, and so this was, you know, I, I, it all didn't all happen in one day. This happened over months and months and months. And then I began traveling when I would visit, go back home to visit, I began traveling into Palestinian communities. And um, now Palestinian communities, some of them are, are actually Israeli citizens. There's Palestinian towns within an area, a certain area that they are actually Israeli citizens. Then there are Palestinians in Jerusalem and then the Palestinians in the West Bank, and they all have different identities, and they all have different laws, anyway. And I was, so first I went to where it was safe, where there are Israeli citizens, and they speak Hebrew, and everybody's, you know, we know they're friendly. 
And I remember drawing, if anybody here, how many people have been here in Palestine, Israel? Can I see a show of hands? Okay. So I, I drove into um, Nazareth. And I just, I froze. Everybody's in Arab. And all the billboards are in Arabic. And everybody can tell that I'm not one of them. And this will surely be my last day on earth. <laughs> and I'm lost. You know, and then later on, I started, I, I ventured into the, um, the West Bank. And I described very vividly my first drive by myself in a rented car into the West Bank, the village of Bilain. And all I, I didn't see the landscape, I didn't see the beautiful olive trees, I didn't see the beautiful hills. All I saw was the Arab around the corner waiting to kill me. That's all I saw. Um, and so that was kind of, all this was, was, was part of this process of dialogue. Now, today, all these years later, there is a, what developed was kind of a dialogue industry, which is very troubling. Because in Palestine today, the, di the dialogue groups, the bereaved families, and several others, and it's not that they don't do important work. Um, but it's kind of become, uh, the term that is used in Arabic is tatbiyah, which is a normalization. So it creates the impression there's a symmetry between the two sides. It creates the impression that we're both suffering, we're both equally guilty, and we're both equally innocent, and therefore all we need to do is sit together, enjoy a good meal, and kind of get it off our chest and get to know one another. But that is not the reality. That is absolutely not the reality. And uh, so today, many people, including myself, uh, stand in opposition to these groups and to this kind of dialogue because it's counterproductive. It's come to a point where, um, and many of them are, are governed and you know, are part of these NGOs, these, these not-for-profit organizations that come to America, get their money, and then continue this process. Um, because when you have a reality, as you do in Palestine, where very clearly there's an oppressor and then there's oppressed. There's an occupier and then there's an occupied. There's a military force, which is really accountable to no one, and acts with impunity, and there are victims. And it's very clear who's who. Then sitting together, you know, eating hummus and, and, and chatting about peace is not the way to go. So today, in that particular context, like I said, the, the whole idea of dialogue is really frowned upon by many people, including myself. Uh, because we cannot allow this to happen. We cannot allow this atmosphere of normalization um, to continue because it's wrong. There needs to be, there needs to be much harsher uh, consequences, I think, uh, particularly to the Israelis, uh, or else things will never change. You know, it's not like the Israelis are being convinced of changing. Nothing's changing. Things are getting worse and worse for Palestinians. Israelis are serving in the military. And at the end of these groups, at the end of these peace camps, at the end of these activities, Palestinians go back to the refugee camps. The Israelis go to the military and shoot them and go to the checkpoints. So what have we achieved? And I'm often asked to come and either speak or participate or facilitate some of these groups or some of these camps. And I tell the organizers that I have a very, I have a, I have a litmus test. And if they pass the litmus test, I will participate. Otherwise, I won't. And my litmus test, and usually these camps and things are, you know, high school kids. If the Israeli kids who participate in these, in these activities return and refuse to serve in the IDF, it's obviously a success, and then I'm willing to participate. If they return and they're still willing to serve in the IDF, in the Israeli army, then the whole thing is a waste of time. So that's my take on, on, again, not on dialogue in general. I'm not saying dialogue is not a good thing. And I would never have reached the place that I did reach in the understanding without that particular form of conversation. But it does have its limitations, and it does, I believe, have its limits. So not where I thought you were going to go with the dialogue question. <laughs> <laughs> but it raises for me the question of, um, hopefulness, right? Because what you're describing is that the dialogue is insufficient in a way because it's individual. 
and the problems are institutionalized. And so, is Alice Walker wrong? Like, do you feel hopeful? Is there hope in this situation? Alice Walker Walker's not wrong. Though. <laughs> <laughs> Alice Walker is a fierce, fierce pro-Palestinian activist. Mm -hmm. She was one on one of the boats, the Gaza. She is fierce. And by the way, if anybody here has not read The Color Purple, drop everything you're doing and read The Color Purple. It's an absolute, absolute masterpiece. Are you ready? No, I'm talking It's an absolute masterpiece. If you get a chance to see the musical, you should do that too. But you should, you know, she is an absolute brilliant woman and a fierce, fierce activist. And um, I was humbled beyond words when she, you know, when she wrote this thing about my book. I am hopeful. That's the point. But I'm not hopeful because things are good. I'm hopeful because, first of all, I know Palestinians, I know many, many Palestinians, and I've never seen a more hopeful people in my life. There's a famous Palestinian poet called Mahmoud Darwish, and he says that Palestinians suffer from the incurable malady of hope. So you have two million people living in a cage in the Gaza Strip without access to water. Without access to water, I'm not kidding you. The highest number of cases of children with kidney failure in the world is in the Gaza Strip. Now, more than half of the population in the Gaza Strip are children. And there are no dialysis machines. And there is no regular electricity. And this is already happening because Israel is making it happen. Because Israel decided that's how it's going to be. Gaza, people in Gaza also have the highest per capita PhD in the world. Now, why would you go get a PhD? Why would you invest years and a lot of money in education if you did not have hope? If things were hopeless, why would you do that? I've never seen a more hopeful people anywhere in my life so that I should not have hope. Being at the top of the privileged food chain as I am, that would be, that would be obscene. So of course I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful because I know that apartheid fell in South Africa. And I know that in 1988, nobody had hoped that apartheid would fall in South Africa. And six years later, six years, which is nothing, Nelson Mandela was president of South Africa. Not just out of jail, not just apartheid fell, but six years later, Mandela was president of South Africa. So things do change. And if we keep plodding along, and you keep working hard, and we keep working and fighting for justice, then things do change, and that's why I do have hope, and that's what I try to, to uh, illustrate in, in, in my book. And I think that's what she's talking about. Um, I want to make sure that we get to your <coughs> new book as well, but I don't want to take away time for people to ask questions. So, the new book just came out literally a couple of weeks ago, right? So most people won't have read it yet. And it's, a, it's an American story in many ways, right? You're talking about five, well, you, give us a sort of brief overview of the story of the new book. So the, story, the new book is, a, is, a, is an American story that would not have happened had it not been for the reality of Palestine. It would not have happened had it not been for the relationship between the government of Israel and the, American, the government of the United States. And it's a story about the Holy Land Foundation, which was at one time the largest Muslim charity in America. They were accused of funding terrorism. Um, they were closed down by George Bush after 9-11 without due process, using an executive order. They were shut down, designated a terrorist organization, and all of their assets were frozen, and they had a lot of money in the bank because this was right after Ramadan when Muslims uh, typically, um, you know, give zakat, give, give donations, give charity. Um, they sued the government, and they didn't think really there was going to be a problem because they did everything right. They only worked with recognized organizations that were vetted by the United States, that American and other international organizations worked with. Every penny that was donated was traced. You could find every penny, where it came from, where it went. Their taxes were filed on time. They had everything done right. And they knew they were immigrants. And they firmly knew, they firmly believed that here in America, when you do everything right, you're going to be fine. 
So the government is hysterical after 9-11. That's perfectly understandable. So they sue the government, which is what we do when the government acts arbitrarily. They prepare, their lawyers prepared a serious file showing exactly, proving without any doubt, <coughs> that they did everything right, that they never gave to any terrorist organizations. In fact, they only worked with recognized, credible organizations. Uh, and the government provided what's called the administrative brief, which is a um, really what the government brings in to show why they did what they did. The government's brief had some newspaper articles, uh, no statements under oath, nothing notarized, a few poorly translated statements that were sent over by the government of Israel saying that Holy Land was supporting Hamas, um, and some statements by other people that were claiming that Holy Land, the members, the, the, the people who ran the organization were members of Hamas. That's it. They went to court, and the judge dismissed the case and struck the evidence from the record, their evidence from the record. Now the problem, that's problematic, I mean, oh, that's problematic to begin, oh, I mean, you know, but besides it being obviously problematic, there was a document in the government's brief that was sent over by the government of Israel where Hoyland Foundation's employee in Jerusalem admitted that they actually gave money to Hamas. So Hoyland's lawyers called his lawyer in Jerusalem, a very well-known civil rights attorney in Jerusalem, and she said, what are you talking about? I have all of the statements. He said, no such thing. So she sent over all of the statements. They had them translated by a notable translation firm, notarized, signed under oath, and he said exactly the opposite. He said, we have never given to any political or military organization, period, only according to need. The right translation was struck from the, from the record. The wrong translation remained. That was in the government's file. That was the beginning. That was the moment they and their lawyers realized something was terribly wrong. Then they went to appeal, and the appellate court said, well, perhaps, perhaps the judge should not have struck the evidence from the record. However, this is not a normal case. And the lawyers are telling me this, and as they're telling me this, this was like 10 years, you know, many years after when I actually wrote about this, and steam is coming out of their ears. These are veteran lawyers that have been around for many years, have done a lot of civil rights uh, litigation. That's when they realized these men were not going to get a fair trial in this country. Being Muslims, being Palestinians, they are guilty. And they were not going to get a fair trial. Then the government prepared a criminal case, and the lawyers were wondering, what, where's the crime? There was no crime. How could there be a criminal case? And then the government started changing the story, said, well, they didn't give money to Hamas, they gave money to other organizations that are controlled by Hamas, they give this, they give that, I won't get into all of it because we're short on time. But basically, change the story, change the story, change the story, and the main problem was the president said one thing, the president claimed that they were funding terrorism, but there was no proof. So now prosecutors have to, have to rush and scramble to put together a case, and there was no case. It took two criminal trials. The first one was hung jury. The second one, finally, they managed to get all convictions. And today, five men, five innocent men, are in federal prison, two for 15 years, one for 20 years, and two for 65 years. And the reason I decided to write the book was because my, when I heard the story the first time, just as you heard it now, pretty much, my reaction was, first of all, it's impossible. This doesn't happen in America. And number two, if this, is what, if this was the result, they must have done something. And I thought it was incredibly important for somebody who looks like me, who comes from my background, to find out um, investigate and write the story so that people will know um, what actually took place. Because it was an unbelievable, undeniable miscarriage of justice of the worst kind. So this book turned your focus a lot more on the U.S. than the first book. Right? The first book was really about Israel and Palestine. 
Um, and it's new, so you might not be able to answer this question yet, but I'm interested in whether the reaction to the book has been different, because you're in America, you're living here, and you're criticizing now the American government. How, how is that going over? Well, the, all, the only reactions I have so far are from people in the, you know, that are close, so I don't know. However, I have a feeling that criticizing America in America is actually a lot more, is, is, is accepted much more than criticizing Israel in America. So I expect I'd actually get a better response, uh, a kinder response from, from people in this country than from the first one, because although I, I firmly believe there's no doubt in my mind, the only reason these men are in prison is because they're Muslims and because they're Palestinians. And the only reason that happens in America is because of what Israel is doing in Palestine. So there's a connection. Uh, but it's much easier to criticize America in America than to criticize Israel in America. Okay, so my last question, and then we'll open it up. So you, you could not have anticipated, when you were the age of the students in the room, how your life would go and that you would end up doing what you're doing now. And you've, cho you've chosen, or you've been led to, or however you want to think about it, some of the prickliest issues of our time, right? Um, and you're raising things that are controversial and heated and um, problematic. So what is the most difficult thing about your work as an activist on these issues? And what's the most satisfying? So the, the hardest, but the, the best about what it is that you do. Okay, the hardest is seeing what is happening to Palestinians. All of my friends, my Palestinian friends in Palestine, either they're in jail, or their children are in jail, or their children are in the hospital because they're recovering from having been shot by the Israelis. Um, <coughs> and that's just the, you know my closer circle of friends. They and they, you know there's thousands of Palestinians who are in this reality, in this in this in this situation. Um, seeing the conditions under which Palestinians have to live, seeing the conditions under which Israel places Palestinians seeing the racism, the oppression, the uncontrollable violence by which Israelis treat Palestinians, with which Israelis treat Palestinians is incredibly difficult. To keep, to, to remain, uh, keep my composure and keep my calm as I see that and the violence is not only, I'm not only talking about violence in terms of shooting and beating and throwing people out of their homes, but the discourse, the discourse in Israeli society, in the news, uh, on the street, when you talk to people, um, is so racist and violent that it is just very, incredibly difficult to take, incredibly difficult to, um, to get to remain calm and, and, and go about your day. Um, the best thing is the people, the relationship. I mean, having done this work, people always say to me, oh, you must have lost friends. Oh, it must be so difficult. It's not. It's been the most rewarding thing I've ever done. I've never met such nice people in my life. This issue brings together the best of the best. Whether the Palestinians or Israelis or Americans or Norwegians or Dane, it makes no difference. The finest people in the world are doing everything they can working on this issue. Not enough. Not enough, and that's why we're still talking about it. But it brings out the finest people I have ever met. And regardless of how much uh, Palestinians are, are, are being beaten, and they're beaten severely, um, they're, they're touched by this you know, incurable malady of hope, and that is uh, the most rewarding thing. These people are the most, the people that I work with are the most rewarding uh, prize anybody can wish for. Thank you. So I think we should open it up for some questions. Um, I think you can moderate your own questions. It seems like you might have done this once or twice before. <laughs> you want me to? Okay. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. I might actually repeat your question because noise can get lost in the room. So maybe I'll do that. That could be my option. Yeah, please. Um, I have read um, Nico's first book, The General Son, and I'm halfway through his second book, 
um, injustice about the Hog Land Foundation Five, and I encourage everyone to read them. They're exceptional. He's a very good writer. And in the Holy Land Foundation Five, there was a quote by, and I can't remember. It was a 12-year-old, and it might have been one of the um, accused sons. I don't recall, but. His question to his father or uncle or friend, whoever this was, was um, why have the Arabs not come to, you know, this was a Palestinian young man, boy, and he said, his question was why have the Arabs, our friends, did not come to help us defeat Israel? And the answer that was given to him was as long as the U.S. is on Israel's side, that will never happen. So my question to you now is, um, we in the U.S. are implicit in all of this that's happening, and if, you know, if the U.S. was not in the equation, what do you think would happen? Hmm. Could you guys hear that question? <laughs> Nothing like starting with an easy one. So the question was, <laughs> if we took, if we were able to take the U.S. out of the equation, basically, how how would this issue between Israel and Palestine go? Well, so the quote is one of the five men. You know, in the story I talk, I give the, the biography of each of every one of them, and they're all Palestinians. And one of them, he's in Gaza, in the Gaza Strip. <laughs> Uh, he's the only one that actually they're not refugees, but they're from Gaza. And he's sitting uh, on the roof of his grandfather's house, kind of enjoying the breeze, the evening breeze, and there was a um, kind of a farmhand that lived on the premises and worked for his grandfather, and, and he's, you know, they're, he's talking to him. And Hassan, he's 10 or 12 years old, and, he's, and they're looking around, and you know, Gaza's on the coast, and you see the beautiful Mediterranean coast, and there's wonderful dune, dunes, sand dunes, which are typical. And then they see the barbed wire cutting through, and the lights on the other side. So he's asking him about that, and then he says to him, well, at one point, how come, why aren't the Arabs, why, why aren't the Arab countries helping us? And he says, well, as long as America, he tells them, you know, this boy, as long as America's helping Israel, um, or this is going to be the reality. Now, America actually came into this very late. You know, uh, foreign aid didn't really start until uh, the Carter administration, the way we know it today. You know, billions and billions each year. And by then, <clears throat> excuse me, Israel had already conquered all of Palestine, pretty much erased it off the map, established itself, established a strong economy, and a very powerful army. Um, so they did pretty well with other allies. I mean, they had other allies, they had the Brits, they had the French, that they always had an ally. Um, however, there's no question that today, the reality is such that American support is so powerful, is so strong, that um, uh, nothing is gonna, nothing, it's, really not, it's hard to imagine anything changes without that changing. And the only way that's gonna change is if people, you know, if, people decide to make, uh, to make a difference. So there's the money issue, $4 billion a year, and that's just the foreign aid. Then on top of that, there's all this NGO money that goes there. Um, the weapons, why Israel needs F-35 fighter planes, I don't know. The enemy is fighting with rocks. But, you know, it's an opportunity to sell the weapons. And there are things like this latest gift, that, that the personal gift from Donald Trump to Benjamin Netanyahu in the form of recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, which was, you, I don't know if anybody here other than Israelis can even begin to comprehend how significant that was. Is, any Israeli prime minister would, would cut up, not their right hand, both their hands, to get something like that. That is monumental. It makes Netanyahu the most powerful politician in the, you know, for, for years to come. Um, and that's, uh, that's, that's very, very tough. So how we, so the question is how we take it out. But if that wasn't there, certainly I think we'd have, uh, things would be, it'd be easier to, to bring about change. There's no question about that. So I'm going to 
somebody here in the front row. <clears throat> How effective do you see the like ongoing march of return protest being in ending the violence, uh, Israeli violence? They're not effective in ending Israeli violence. Um, obviously, they're being met by enormous violence, as, as I'm sure if you've kept up the last few Fridays, uh, these marches in Gaza. Um, they're met with enormous violence, and I think that's, that was to be expected. I don't think anybody had any doubt that this would be the case, and I don't think it's going to end. Um, Israel shoots with impunity. Israel, Israeli soldier knows they can kill a Palestinian and nothing's going to happen. Uh, except for rare, rare, extremely rare situations. Nothing will happen, and um, this whole hype about how they are terrorists and how they're Hamas and how they're this and how they're that and how they're trying to breach, you know, is Israel's borders. You know, the Gaza Strip is not a border. The Gaza Strip is a is a prison wall. I mean, the this this, this the fence there is a prison wall. The Gaza Strip was created by Israel in order to imprison Palestinians, Palestinian refugees. Those people, their homes and their land are on the other side. They have a right to go to the other side. It is their land. It is their home. It is their water. They're in a prison. And their only crime is that they're Palestinians. Um, and that's what this is about. And it's going to increase and increase and increase until May 15, which is when Israel celebrates or, uh, you know, it's, it's 70th anniversary, 70th Independence Day, and the Palestinians commemorate seven decades of, of genocide, basically. So I don't, it's not going, I don't think Israeli violence is going to decrease at all, because why should they? This is what they do, they kill Palestinians. You know? But I think as much as we can, that's why I wear this Gaza thing, as much as we can bring awareness to the reality and to remember that the Gaza Strip is not an international border. It is a prison wall. This fence that they, walk, that they walk up to, and they're not even allowed to walk up to it, this wall is a prison wall that was erected by Israel to imprison Palestinian refugees. Yeah, way in the back. Um, so growing up Jewish in America, I've been exposed to a lot of um, pro-Israel propaganda. Um, and any conversations criticizing um, Israel um, or expressing any kind of like sympathy for Palestinians um, tend to be shut down. Um, or, you know, people make excuses uh, for the Israeli government. Um, so I was wondering if you have any thoughts on how to um, avoid ending up with, or like avoid this connection between critiquing Israel as being anti-Jewish um, and just like opening up that conversation. I think I'll repeat that first because it's probably couldn't people hear. on this side. Yeah. So the question is, growing up Jewish in America, how how do you is it possible to have a conversation in which you criticize Israel without receiving the label of being anti-Jewish? How can those two things be uncoupled? Yeah, the biggest success that uh, uh, that Israel has had, and actually this happened even before Israel was established. It was. It was as a result of very, very hard work by the Zionist movement. The Zionist movement is the movement that established the state of Israel. Um, was to conflate being Jewish with being Zionist. And they brought it to a point where today, if you criticize Israel, you're called anti-Semitic. Even though there have always been, and there still are today, many, many Jewish people who either reject or oppose the state of Israel. Um, so that's a, that, that's, that's a, that's a, that, this, is, this is a difficult conversation that anybody who cares enough for Palestine and wants to see justice and, 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 and freedom and democracy and, and so forth in Palestine has to be, has to realize this is going to be, this is the reality. Here in America, there is a very, very powerful movement that wants to conflate Jews with Zionism and forget the fact, ignore the fact that so many Jews oppose Zionism. Um, and at the same time, conflate anything that's Palestinian or, or has, shows solidarity with the Palestinian cause as anti-Semitic or as supporting uh, terrorism. This is the reality in which we live. This is the reality in which we have to fight. I mean, this is the reality. We can't ignore it. And in many cases, I hear people say, well, how do I approach my, 
my parents? How do I approach my neighbors? How do I approach my friends? And the only suggestion I have, I mean, it's a tough one. There's no question. There's, not, this, there's no easy answer. But I'll try to put it in a way that's perhaps a little bit more extreme. If these family members or neighbors were supporting the KKK, would you still engage with them as friends and family? Or would you have a different, different attitude? If they were neo-Nazis, or if they were skinheads, or if they supported apartheid in any way, any form of other form of racism and violence, would you still have a problem disengaging? This should be the standard. Violence is violence. Racism is racism. Oppression is oppression. It's always wrong. It doesn't matter if it's committed by Jews or by anybody else. It's always wrong. Some people say, well, you know, Jews have suffered so much, we've got to give them a break. Why? What do you mean give them a break? Are we open, go, going to open all the jails and let all the Jews out because Jews suffered? I mean, it's an absurd idea. What is happening in Palestine, what Zionist Jews have done and continue to do in Palestine, is racism and violence. And then, as racists always do, they use lies in order to explain and justify and excuse what they do. So, if it's wrong, it's wrong. Whether they're Jews or not Jews should be irrelevant. And I think that should be the standard. You know, if these were, if they were supporting any kind of racism, if they're KKK people, would you still engage with them in conversation? Would you have a problem in just, you know, uh, with this issue as, as, you know, as we do today? I think that is, has to be very clear. And I think that the synagogues and the Jewish organizations and the Jewish politicians, Chuck Schumer and many of those others, need to be called out on this. They are supporting racism and violence. They are supporting racism and violence. They're justifying it, they're excusing it, and they need to be called out on that, because that is exactly what this is. And if we believe in human rights, equality, freedom, and so forth, then we should not be supporting Israel. But it's not, I'm not, I'm not trying to, I'm not gonna say this is an easy conversation to have, particularly if it's inside your family um, or with friends. It's not an easy conversation to have. At the same time, it's a conversation we must have if we're going to be engaged. Could you uh, speak to the picture from far, far away that I have of the Palestinians being led by terrorist-minded people that teach their children that Jews are pigs and to go and stab them and we'll get paid a pension if you kill a Jew for life? Well, I'm not from far, far away. I'm from very, very close and I don't know that any of that is true. None of that is true. Absolutely, categorically untrue. And I'm speaking as someone who is very, very close. And, and it, it spends at least half my time there and the rest of my time talking and dealing with this issue. So none of that is true. Um, but that is a picture that is being portrayed so that we all maintain the narrative which puts Israel on the right side and the Palestinians as these wild you know, anti-Semitic murderers. Uh, yeah. First of all, thank you for being here. This is, this is great. Um, my question is, our son is currently in Hebron working with Christian peacemaker teams. And have you worked with any activist groups like CPT or anything? Oh, absolutely. I know Hebron well, and I know CPT well, and I know everything in settlement, of course, yes. Yeah. Good for him. That's great. God bless him. <laughs> He's doing important work. The reality in Hebron, you know, we were talking about this earlier, where is it harder, Jerusalem, Hebron? Eh, it's hard to say. Um, but the reality and the work that volunteers do to come and help the Palestinians in Hebron, particularly in the old city of Hebron, it's not even something you can start to describe because I think it's so absurd that it's impossible to describe because as you describe it, you think, wait a minute, is this true? Uh, Palestinian children are afraid to go to school and they cannot go to school unaccompanied because Israeli settlers harass them and attack them. And the soldiers, who are everywhere, are always protecting the Israeli settlers. So you have volunteer groups like Christian Peacemakers and many other, and several others uh, who go there and volunteer just to walk the kids to school. 
just to make sure that the settlers don't urinate in the water tanks that the Palestinians have. That make sure that some of the violence by the settlers and the soldiers is somewhat checked and documented. Um, and it's, it's, it, it, it's incredibly important work because if we on the outside don't participate in this, then it's, uh, Palestinians will be eliminated. It's, um, if I was to compare this to something, I would say Palestine is a human being bleeding to death very, very fast. All the solidarity work is great, but action, being there, supporting them, making sure that the um, Betty McCollum's bill in Congress, and you know about that, we have to start taking action. We have to start doing things more than solidarity, more than just talking about it and wearing the t-shirts and the kofiya, but actually getting physically, physically involved. Because the patient is dying rapidly. And what they need is urgent care. And any participation, uh, whether it's on the ground there or in different groups here, or again, the McCollum bill, look it up if you don't know what I'm talking about. It's a bill that talks about the, uh, the detention and abuse of Palestinian children by the Israeli forces. We're talking about thousands and thousands of kids of children. And so Betty McCollum, um, she, she's got about 30 sponsors, I think, already. Um, it's a bill that says that, first of all, recognizes it and talks about um, the need to make sure that U.S. money is not going to, uh, to, you know, to support that. Um, there's a reality that is incredibly severe, that is far above and beyond most of us could have even imagined would happen. And so, um, action is, and, and, and urgent action is, is, is badly needed. So thank you to all my thanks. I, I want to push you a little bit on this question, and then we'll take one more question, because we're at 8 o'clock. But the question about the Palestinian children being taught horrible things about Jews, um, there, there is an element of hatred on both sides, right? These kids grow up hating the kids on the other side of that fence. And I wonder, to tie those two questions together, is there any piece work being done focused on children to, to try to overcome that initial festering of hatred? I've been doing this for a long time. And I, I whether I'm in Gaza, I was in Gaza or in Hebron or in any other Palestinian town, city, refugee camp, and I, and, and in all humility, I will say that I'm in, the, the, the relationship that I have with, in Palestine is one where, you know, you know how, I don't know if you saw the movie, uh, uh, what was it called, uh, Butler? Anyway, there's this part, part there where, where you know, he's, he's, he's a black butler that worked in the White House. And at one point, as he's growing up, one of his mentors says to him, remember to have the two faces. You got a face for the man, and you got a face for your own people. You know, every oppressed people have that. There's the face that you show the man, the oppressor, the white guy, and there's the, the true face that you only show to your own people. So I'm at a point in when I'm in Palestine when I don't, I'm not the man. I'm like people talk, you know, we talk about everything. There is not a sense that there, anybody's trying to not say things around me. And I'll say it again, whether it's in Gaza, whether it's in Mecca Desert, whether it's in Galilee, Jerusalem, Khalid, Hebron. I have never heard this. I have never heard this. I've never heard anybody come up and say, we hate Jews, we're going to kill Jews. I learned in school. Ever. Not once. And I know hundreds of people who do the work that I do and will tell you the exact same thing. It does not exist. Even though, I promise you, that if any one of us lived in Gaza for five minutes, we would hate Jews. All Jews. Because Jews send money, Jews drop the bombs, Jews, Jews are in the army, and Jews over here support Israel. And it's a Jewish state. Declared itself as a Jewish state. The only thing you ever hear is Palestinians explaining very slowly and very clearly so all of the white people will understand there is no issue with Jews. The issue is with the occupation. The issue is the soldiers. The issue is the settlers. The issue is Israel. 
It is not, it is not, it is not the Jews. There is no such thing. No such thing. And it's absolutely unbelievable that people would live in that kind of environment and would not hate Jews. <coughs> and I'm Israeli, and it's hard for me not to hate other Israelis when I see what is happening. It does not exist. You can ask me, you can ask hundreds of other um, people who work with Palestine, activists, act, ask his son when he comes back. You know, that's not the conversation. It's not in the textbooks, it's not in the schools, it's not at home. Quite the opposite. It doesn't exist. The only place it exists is in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the mythology, in the literature that Israel puts out on Palestinians. As though they know better. I was in an interview once, and uh, it's, on, it's online on YouTube, and the interviewer said to me, yes, but there are videos. So that's the proof? That's the burden of proof that somebody posts a video on YouTube? That's the burden of proof the Palestinians hate? The Palestinians in the room, ask them. It is the most remarkable thing I've ever seen. In Gaza, you walk around Gaza, you see more destruction than you could possibly imagine. People with no access to water. If their kids are born with a curable cancer, they will die. Why? Because the Jews on the other side are preventing the medicine. You never hear anybody talk about the Jews. The problem is the occupation, the problem is the state of Israel, the problem is the military, the problem is the settlers. Very pinpointed, very, very clear. And I think it's really, really important to you know, come to terms with that. Okay, I think we should take one last question. Um, what is the vision of the Israeli government about the future? Are they that? going to continue to hold the Palestinians to the subject people? Yes. Yes. This is the vision. The reality, the, the ideology and, the, and, the, and the, the thinking that Israelis have about this issue the Israeli government, uh, journalists, uh, the public, is as follows. We have no choice, so we have to be here. Uh, they hate us because we're here, because obviously we took their land. Uh, that's a reality. As long as we are strong, as long as we can kill more of them than they kill of us, then this is it. This is it. There's always going to be perpetual war because we live in this reality and, you know, what are you going to do? These are Arabs and they're violent and they're hateful. And that's how we're going to live. So we need nuclear weapons, we need uh, F-35s, we need a strong army. If they raise their head, we beat them as hard as we can. And that's how we're going to survive. That is the end game. There is no end game beyond that. There's no such thing. Peace has never been a strategic part of Israeli thinking, ever. Maintaining power has always been the most important strategic objective. Always. From the very beginning, from the very first Israeli government, all the way till today. It's never changed. It's maintaining the land, either getting rid of the people or creating life conditions that are so harsh that they will either leave or die, and making sure that we are strong, we are rich, we are powerful, and that America supports us. That is the end game. This is it. Peace has never been part of the, has never been a, part of an important strategy, unless you're talking about, you know, Egypt, Jordan, these other big countries, um, which, by the way, would never have made peace with Israel had they had democratic regimes. So Israel makes sure that they don't. You know, the regimes in Egypt, the regime in Jordan, the reason they do not have democracies is because Israel pays, and the United States supports with weapons and money these demo these very undemocratic regimes, and Saudi Arabia and the Gulf. And the regimes that were equally undemocratic but did not play well with Israel were Iraq and Syria and Yemen and Libya, and they were all destroyed. That's the lesson in the Middle East. So it's not about peace, it's about maintaining power, it's making sure that we are the toughest, meanest bully in the neighborhood so nobody messes with us. That's the strategy. And that's the end game. And that's really the tragedy of the story. But Mr. Speaker, who is firing against the Iron Dome? I'm actually going to butt in <laughs> and say, so the theme for the Center for Ethics this year was difficult conversations. 
and I would say that you have proved to us that this is one. <laughs> but I'm really grateful that you've started it on our campus. And I want to thank you for coming here, and you, whether you know it or not, you're going to be outside for about 20 minutes <laughs> signing books for anyone that would like to purchase one or maybe ask a couple more questions outside. So thank you very much. Thank you. responsibility as probably some of the most privileged and richest people on earth to get engaged, to get educated, and to make a difference. And if we all do that, then not only Palestine will be in better shape, but a lot of other places around the world will be in better shape. Thank you.